Section 8 of The Maker of Rainbows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. The Maker of Rainbows by Richard Le Gallian. The Rags of Queen Cophetua. When the first dazzle of bewildered happiness in her new estate had faded from her eyes, and the miracle of her startling metamorphosis from a wandering beggar maid to a great queen on a throne was beginning to lose a little of its wonder and to take its place among the accepted realities of life, Queen Cophetua became growingly conscious of some dim dissatisfaction and unrest in her heart. Indeed, she had all that the world could give, and surely all that a woman's heart is supposed to desire the king's love was still hers as when he found her at dawn by the pool in the forest and in exchange for the tattered rags which had barely concealed the water lily whiteness of her body countless wardrobes were filled with garments of every variety of subtle design and exquisite fabric textures light as the golden sun purple as the wine-dark sea, iridescent as the rainbow, and soft as summer clouds, the better to set off her strange beauty for the eyes of the king. And every day of the year the king brought her a new and priceless jewel to hang about her neck, or wear upon her moonbeam hands, or to shine in the fragrant night of her hair. Ah, what a magical wooing that had been in the depths of the forest that strange morning. The sun was hardly above the tops of the trees when she had awakened from sleep at the mossy foot of a giant beech, and its first beams were casting a solemn enchantment across a great pool of water lilies and filling their ivory cups with strange gold. She had lain still a while, watching through her sleepy eyelids the unfolding marvel of the dawn, and then rousing herself, she had knelt by the pool, and letting down her long hair that fell almost to her feet, had combed and braided it, with the pool for her mirror, a mirror with water lilies for its frame. And as she gazed at herself in the clear water, with a girlish happiness in her own beauty, a shadow fell over the pond and startled she saw beside her own face in the mirror the face of a beautiful young knight so it seemed bending over her shoulder in fear and maiden modesty for her hair was only half braided and whiter than any water lily in the pond her bosom glowed bare in the morning sunlight she turned around and met the eyes of the king without moving each gazed at the other as in a dream eyes lost fathom deep in eyes at last the king found voice to speak you must be a fairy he had said for surely you are too beautiful to be human nay my lord she had answered i am but a poor girl that wanders with my lute yonder from village to village and town to town singing my little songs you shall wander no more said the king come with me and you shall sit upon a throne and be my queen, and I will love you forever. But she could not answer a word for fear and joy, and therewith the king took her by the hand, and set her upon his horse that was grazing hard by, and, mounting behind her, he rode with her in his arms to the city, and all the while her eyes looked up into his eyes, as she leaned upon his shoulder, and his eyes looked deep down into hers, but they spake not a word. Only once, at the edge of the forest, he had bent down and kissed her on the lips, and it seemed to both as if heaven, with all its stars, was falling into their hearts. As they rode through the city to the palace, surrounded by wondering crowds, she nestled closer to his side, like a frightened bird, and like a wild bird's were her great eyes gazing up into his in a terror of joy not once did she move them to right or left for all the murmur of the people about them nor did the king see aught but her water-lily face as they wended thus in a dream through the crowded streets and at length came to the marble steps of the palace then the king 
leaping from his horse, took her tenderly in his arms, and carried her lightly up the marble steps. Upon the topmost step he set her down, and taking her hand in his, as she stood timidly by his side, he turned his face to the multitude and spake. Lo, my people, he said, this is your queen, whom God has sent to me by a divine miracle, to rule over your hearts from this day forth, as she holds rule over mine. My people, salute your queen. And therewith the king knelt on one knee to his beggar maid, and kissed her hand. And all the people knelt likewise, with bowed heads, and a great cry went up. Our queen! Our queen! Then the king and queen passed into the palace, and the tiring maids led the little beggar maid into a great chamber, hung with tapestries and furnished with many mirrors, and they took from off her white body the tattered gown she had worn in the forest, and robed her in perfumed linen and cloth of gold, and set jewels at her throat and in her hair. And at evening, in the cathedral, before the high altar, in the presence of all the people, the king placed a sapphire, beautiful as the evening star upon her finger, and the twain became man and wife, and the moon rose, and the little beggar maid was a queen, and lay in a great king's arms. On the morrow the king summoned a famous worker in metals attached to his court, and commanded him to make a beautiful coffer of beaten gold, in which to place the little ragged robe of his beggar maid, for it was very sacred to him because of his great love. After due time the coffer was finished, and it was acclaimed the masterpiece of the great artificer who had made it. About its sides was embossed the story of the king's love. On one side was the pool with the water lilies, and the beggar maid braiding her hair on its brink, and on another she was riding on horseback with the king through the forest, and on another she was standing by his side on the steps of the palace, before all the people, and on the fourth side she was kneeling by the king's side before the high altar in the cathedral. The king placed the coffer in a secret gallery attached to the royal apartments, and very tenderly he placed therein the little tattered gown and the lute with which his queen was wont to wander from village to village and town to town, singing her little songs. Often at evening, when his heart brimmed over with the tenderness of his love, he would persuade his queen to doff her beautiful royal garments and clothe herself again in that little tattered gown, through the rents of which her white body showed whiter than any water lilies. And however rich or exquisite the other garments she wore, it was in those beloved rags the king declared that she looked most beautiful, in them he loved her best. But this had been a while ago, and though, as has been said, the king's love was still hers as when he had met her that strange morning in the forest, and though every day he brought her a new and priceless jewel to hang about her neck, or wear upon her moonbeam hands, or to shine in the fragrant night of her hair, it was many months since he had asked her to wear for him the little tattered gown. Was the miracle of their love beginning to lose a little of its wonder for him, too? Was it beginning to take its place among the accepted realities of life? Sometimes the queen fancied that he seemed a little impatient with her elfin bird-like ways, as though in his heart he was beginning to wish that she was more in harmony with the folk around her more like the worldly court ladies with their great manners and artificial smiles for though she had now been a queen a long while she had never changed she was still the wild gypsy-hearted child the king had found braiding her hair that morning by the lilied pool often she would steal away by herself and enter that secret gallery and lift the lid of the golden coffer and look wistfully at the little tattered robe and run her hands over the cracked strings of her little lute there was a long window in the gallery from which far away she could see the great green cloud of the forest 
and as the days went by she often found herself seated at this window gazing in its direction with vague unformed feelings of sadness in her heart one day as she sat there at the window an impulse came over her that she could not resist and swiftly she slipped off her beautiful garments and taking the little robe from the coffer clothed herself in the rags that the king had loved and she took the old lute in her hands and sang low to herself her old wandering songs and she danced too an elfin dance all alone there in the still gallery danced as the apple blossoms dance on the spring winds or the autumn leaves dance in the depths of the forest suddenly she ceased in alarm the king had entered the gallery unperceived and was watching her with sad eyes are you weary of being a queen said he sadly for answer she threw herself on his breast and wept bitterly she knew not why oh i love you i love you she sobbed but this life is not real and the king went from her with a heavy heart and from day to day an unspoken sorrow lay between them and from day to day the king's words haunted the queen with a more insistent refrain are you weary of being a queen was she weary of being a queen and so the days went by one day as the queen passed down the palace steps she came upon a beautiful girl clothed in tatters as she had once been seated on the lowest step selling flowers water lilies the queen stopped where did you gather your water lilies child she asked i gathered them from a pool in the great forest yonder answered the girl with a curtsy give me one of them said the queen with a sob in her voice and she slipped a piece of gold into the girl's hand and fled back into the palace that night as she lay awake by her sleeping king she rose silently and stole into the secret gallery there with tears running down her cheeks she dressed herself in the little tattered gown and took the lute in her hand and then stole back and pressed a last kiss on the brow of her sleeping king who still slept on but at sunrise the king awoke with a sudden fear in his heart and lo where his queen had lain was only a white water lily and at that moment in the depths of the forest a beggar maid was braiding her hair with a pool of water lilies for her mirror. End of section 8